Thank you, Nagar, and thank you, Beth, for those outstanding presentations. I might start by just asking John if you want to react to anything you heard and maybe ask the first question of our panelists. So Results for America has these three principles. One, build evidence. Second, invest in what works. And third, which is always the most complicated, and I will tell you in uh, selling this idea to Republican members in the Congress, absolutely <laughs> critical, which is shifting funds away from programs that are not uh, proven to be ineffective. And I'd like to ask you, Beth, given what MCC has done on these compacts, um, how you think about that and concrete examples of when you've shifted funds away uh, from uh, compacts or programs within MCC? Sure. Um, well, I would say we think about it in a few different ways because accountability at MCC is not only accountability for results, but also we have some pretty strict accountability standards through which we choose our country partners. Um, and I think maybe since we talked a little bit about, about the evaluations, I'll, I'll talk about that. And certainly we use um, monitoring data to ensure that our programs are on track. And when they're not, very often we'll have rescoping or we'll reallocate funds away from one project in a compact to another project in a compact. Um, but uh, what sometimes happens, not very often, but sometimes is that our countries themselves um, can uh, sort of fall back on their commitments to the good governance standards that we expect of our partner countries. And when we see slippage like that, we have a dialogue with our, our partner countries about that. Um, and very often, those things are temporary. The government takes some, um, some measures to mitigate the effects of that or to um, you know, put new policies in place and actually reverse that trend. Um, sometimes, however, you see that a situation arises that, that isn't going to be reversed or isn't being reversed very quickly. And in that case, um, there have been uh, six times during compact implementation where we have suspended or terminated implementation of a compact. Um, and then uh, most recently, um, we actually suspended uh, the development of the compact with Tanzania, of a second compact with Tanzania, because of some election irregularities. Very good, thank you. Well, so bu building on that, maybe I'll ask both of you to address what, what is the, when you are making changes in programs based on uh, either intermediate findings from evaluations or, uh, or final evaluation data or, as you just point out, uh, countries backsliding on the criteria that allowed them to qualify for the program in the first place. W w offer folks some color in terms of what, what kind of pushback do you get from either other agencies, the Hill, uh, your partners out in the field, what, or, or do you not get the pushback? What, what's tough about it? What kind of pushback would you get and how do you overcome that? I'll start. Um, well, you know, these are painful decisions yeah. to make, right? There, are, there has been a lot of time on both sides of, uh, of the partnership invested in moving these partnerships forward. And in fact, you know, not only are there robust country teams at the at MCC headquarters who are working on this, sector experts, economists, monitoring and evaluation experts, a whole host of people who've devoted a lot of time and effort into this. Um, but we have a, a full complement of country counterparts. There is a monitoring and evaluation specialist at the country level. There's an economist. There are sector experts and project directors and, and, and all sorts of people, a whole team there, that have also invested a lot of, of time and effort in this as well. And I think there's, um, so, so one of the most difficult things is actually understanding that this is something that needs to be done um, because, and, and you know, people at MCC inherently understand that, but it doesn't make it any less painful um, or disappointing when it has to happen. So that's, it's sort of the internal, um, you know, the internal barriers first that, that need to be overcome. Um, and then I think, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of times when, um, you know, we're continuing to, we're, we're going to stop engaging with a country or suspend engagement with a country, but there are other um, parts of the government that will continue just because we have a different model and, and, and do different types of things than other government agencies. Um, and you, you just often need to explain, you know, what the MCC standards are and what MCC's approach is, and those can be fairly easily overcome. Um, and then the countries themselves, I and mean, very often we get a lot of pushback saying if you really cared about poverty reduction, you wouldn't pull out. Um, and you know, I, I understand those as well. Um, but again, I think that we, we have our model and, and our commitment to transparency to fall back on here. These decisions aren't made in a black box. Um, and the fact that everyone understands why and how they're being made, I think, is very important. Good. Nagar? Yes. So I would just start off uh, by saying I think for, 
Folks that are familiar with USAID's budgeting and programming processes, you know that a lot of uh, the work we do is has a lot of involvement by Congress through earmarks. So from the starting point, we don't have a blank slate of how we're gonna do our work. But having said that, I think when you get to the country level and you're programming uh, whatever sector you're in, I think the biggest pushback we get is probably um, from a contracting lens. So it's really a legalistic interpretation of, you said that we were in this partnership to do X, and even if we've gone in this direction, it doesn't matter because we signed this agreement to do X. So that is incredibly frustrating, but it's something that we're actually working really closely um, in the coming, we're, we've been working on it over the last year, but we've launched this effort around adaptive management, which is sort of a buzzword. Um, DFID is very engaged in this, as is the World Bank. But it's looking at, rather than having to get to the stage in the middle of a project where you realize something isn't working and you have to pull out, why can't we have more iterative and more rapid feedback loops in our monitoring and evaluation to be able to make course corrections much more quickly? So we think this is a much more efficient and less painful way of making needed changes as we get evidence in real time. You know, I'll just add uh, my own answer to that is, is that I used to get a, a, the most intense sort of phone calls from the Hill or from external partners uh, were often linked to programs that we were in the process of closing out of or shutting down because the results of the evaluation policy indicated they should be. And, uh, and, and we would share that data publicly uh, and with partners. And, uh, but nevertheless, that's usually not enough to allay the concerns of external partners who would no longer be receiving funds or their very committed members of Congress or the Senate who you know, do care deeply about specific programs and don't always get the opportunity to engage with, well, if we use those resources elsewhere, they can generate even more good. So, uh, so I, I, what I commend both agencies for is a commitment to maintain this approach, uh, even when it's tough, to make those, those reallocations. I guess I'd ask, as you look out over the next, uh, call it five years, or, or to the next uh, administration that takes hold, what, what do you think is the next priority? I mean, here, USAID, MCC are at the top of the list in the, in the What Works Index. Um, and yet, I know each of you leads an effort to maintain culture and focus and excellence on the concept of using data and results to guide programmatic decisions. Are there any kind of big observations you would share with an incoming administration that would say, hey, over the next term or two terms, the challenge in maintaining this really excellent position at the top of the list is going to be the following thing? Do you want me to start? Um, so I would say in the realm of evidence and data, some of the big challenges that I think are really important for focus, uh, one is around partnerships that, like at USAID, we don't have all the answers ourselves and we shouldn't have all the answers ourselves. So being really deliberate about partnering with non-traditional actors that could advance our work in this space with academics, with researchers, and forging those alliances which our Global Development Lab has done but really advancing that to bring the best knowledge and evidence and methods into the agency for use. Um, I think there is sometimes a reliance in the government to just keep your head down and focus on what's happening in your agency, and I think we're past that era. So I would say that's a big one. Um, I think the other <clears throat> challenge and something to focus on is around the area of knowledge management. So in a in the age that we're in, which is big data and so much information, how do you distill what is really essential for you to make decisions? And that's something I think we're all sort of experimenting with, but I think it's gonna be an ongoing challenge, especially in um, this sector of evidence and data. I would say I completely agree with what Nagar said. Um, I, from MCC's perspective, I would say um, there, there are two, uh, well, there are probably many priorities, but just two that I'll highlight. One is, as Nagar was talking about before, increasing the use of real-time data and some of the newer technologies and, and, and sort of the abilities to actually find 
uh, to communicate in more real time with beneficiaries um, to, to enable us to make uh, more mid-course corrections and programs and, um, and iterate you know, in, in a way that it's very difficult to when you have a, a very long planning process followed by a, um, you know, a five-year implementation process. Um, I think the, the iterating is very difficult um, to do, especially if you don't have that real-time data coming in. And then once you get it, you need to know what to do with it um, and actually have a culture that allows you to iterate. So that's one, one thing I would say. You know, another thing is that um, in the context of the sustainable development goals, um, and I think also in the context of what you were saying before with respect to countries' own capabilities, um, we really need to be helping um, developing countries that don't have the capacity to collect and analyze and use data on their own do a better job of it. Because if we expect them to take on a lot of the responsibility for development, which I think is, a, is an absolutely essential expectation, and certainly where the state of the art is going and where the development conversation is going, um, you know, a lot of times you know, we, there are huge differences among in some of the, co the countries that we work in. Some are very data-rich environments, some are very data poor environments, some have great data uh, gathering and analytical capacity, some don't. Um, and I think that's a huge problem. Uh, we need to make sure that our partner countries have uh, as much of an ability as possible to collect their own data, to analyze it, um, and that data is being made uh, available and also usable for them. John, maybe we could build on that and we ask you a question, because you've had this amazing perspective at the top of the system across all of the different parts of the federal government that have aspired to be more evidence-based in, in their work. Do you have any thoughts on, or are you surprised by anything that you're, you're talking about? We're here talking about foreign assistance as an area that seems particularly energetic about results-oriented uh, allocation and, and execution. And are there any lessons this field should learn from other parts of federal policy making and incorporate those lessons to get even better? Yeah, so having a little window into the, when I was in the, working in the Congress, if you were to tell me that there was going to be an evidence-based um, policy panel that would have an, produce an index where uh, USAID and then this newly created organization in foreign aid were uh, not only to lead the index, but actually um, attract more increases in federal appropriations on a bipartisan basis than anything else I can think of, I would have thought that uh, you had shot yourself to Mars. Um, <laughs> and it, it's a remarkable story, really, I think. And it, to me, to your point, Beth, about when I was in Zanzibar and I saw across all these health systems in sub-Saharan African countries, uh, wonderful work, you know, uh, national uh, ministers of health with health targets, uh, organizations on the ground working to meet those targets. But it was only in Zanzibar that I saw the science monitoring and evaluation systems that were sophisticated enough and that had, you know, with the RDTs, rapid di doc diagnostic tests, the technology feedback lo loops into the health systems to, to rapidly mobilize responses, that I felt confident that um, uh, the gains that were made in that country could be actually preserved in others. And so I think your point, getting the indigenous leadership and the same kind of commitment in Africa that we're, we're building here in terms of commitment to science and evaluation and evidence. Uh, the other thing I'd say just quickly is uh, the power of setting very clear, understandable goals. When this goal was set, universal coverage of bed nets by the end of 2010, most people laughed. And then the Gates Foundation, the World Bank, the Global Fund, <laughs> PMI, all these institutions stepped up because this was funding one of four evidence-based interventions that we knew would fully prevent and treat, treat uh, malaria. And so the more we can follow the evidence, set clear goals, have a strategy to meet them, and then to your point, Nagar, create a culture within these agencies that's really committed to your point, not just next year or when the initiative gets a lot of fanfare, but over you know, a decadal plus commitment to meeting those goals, I think that's when we're going to see great success. Well, that is a very special point to end on because uh, great success in this field is truly related to wiping out the kind of extreme poverty where uh, a young child dies of a mosquito bite and that's acceptable because it's what everybody sees and, and understands is just the way life is. And success in this field means 
you know, millions of girls in Afghanistan going to school so that our troops can come home and there can be some basis of stability and justice in that society. And, and I think the Millennium Challenge Corporation, USAID, uh, a number of other partners in global development from private foundations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to uh, larger public institutions and even some corporate entities that do their own work in this space uh, increasingly understand that deploying resources, whether it's people or money or technology in these settings is not really just about the deployment itself, it's about measuring, adapting to and delivering these profoundly important human results. And the credit for that as the defining feature of this field, in my view, is a bipartisan legacy that in many ways was greatly accelerated by your leadership and Michael's leadership and of course President Bush's leadership. Uh, and I hope also extended by the efforts that President Obama and Secretary Clinton and others have made and Secretary Kerry to continue to move this forward. And we know that both Nagar and Beth and your great institutions carry the torch forward for all of us. So thank you for taking the time to be with us. Thank you, John, for your leadership here.